My name is Louis Pladden Wardler from a company called Terrestrial Energy. I'm based in London, but the centre of gravity of the company is in Oakville outside Toronto, where we've been working for nearly nine years actually to take a, a, an innovative liquid fuel design through the regulatory process in Canada, which is a process that should be more or less complete towards the end of this year. Um, I'll go through this uh, presentation and I, I may be a bit unstudied because I'm a last minute substitute. So we, we have a 30% question and I think some of the presentations this morning were very much on this point, which is that electricity is not the entire game. There are a large number of industrial processes from plastics and oil refining, ammonia production, hydrogen production, a slew of um, uh, industries that in many cases, as far as Europe is concerned, have gone offshore to China because the coal is cheaper there and people don't worry so much about the um, uh, pollution of it. So to allow nuclear to really do what it can to address the economic um, potential fossilization of uh, Europe and the US, we have to look beyond electricity and we have to look towards high heat. So I think it's true to say that because high temperature reactors present particular issues in relation to materials usage um, and you know they they have not been the market standard although the UK is a sort of honorable exception although with its advanced gas reactors but they haven't really been used for their industrial process applications because carbon dioxide isn't a terrific heat transport medium apart from anything else. So I understand, I'm a lawyer, not an engineer, so don't quiz me too hard on these um, difficult technical issues. <laughs> but the point is that there is a, a big, big space in the market for industrial process heat usage. And this is a, a, an important and very hard to address aspect of the economy. So here's a picture of our plant. And uh, unfortunately, unlike Rolls-Royce, it doesn't quite have the architectural beauty. Although I suppose, I suppose, I, I suppose we could put a tent over it. Um, but it, it is a, it, it's an industrial facility, so it's not really designed to look pretty. And the R1 and the R2 refer to the two reactor units that are there which are about 400 megawatt thermal and about 200 megawatt electrical each with the turbine building behind. And again, one of the um, valuable aspects of using as your coolant a liquid is that it's relatively easy to transport relatively far from the facility. So as well as having turbines on the um, on the site or just outside of the nuclear curtilage, you can transport that heat to perhaps an ammonia facility. Is it doing this quite a compact plant. It, so the the plant is on about seven hectares. So it, it's uh, 400 megawatts on seven hectares, which is pretty energy dense. So here's a, a schematic picture which shows a number of um, potential thermal electric facilities, pure electric transmission, a wind farm to emphasize the fact that this type of system is particularly good at load following and therefore potentially supporting the lapses in, um, in generation from, uh, from, from wind and solar. So the Picture on the right is the integral molten salt reactor, the core unit, which is the heat engine, the, the, the furnace for this particular uh, machine. And again, I, I won't spend long on this slide because it's a, it, it's a bit uh, diagrammatic, but essentially it's showing that in the 
co-generation um, aspect of things, power generation, industrial process heat, and grid services are really three separate services that we can supply very effectively to the market. This is a slide which really has some key numbers. And I think the key numbers here are less than $6 um, millions of British thermal units, a more efficient because it's high temperature unit in terms of electricity generation. So typically a lower temperature LWR will be about 33%, 34% efficient, whereas you're coming up for 50% if you're at 585 degrees, which is where we are at our point of heat use. And again, unlike some of the advanced um, hot reactor systems, we're not dependent on um, high assay, low enriched uranium. We use less than 5% low enriched uranium, which is in the supply chain and therefore is suitable for ready deployment. I'll skip over some of these more technical slides, but I think that the regulatory engagement is important. As I say, we've been doing this for um, uh, about nine years, about seven years of which has been engaged with the Canadian regulator, which is not transferable to other jurisdictions, but we have, for example, done a joint technical review with the NRC, and um, we, we think that the um, CNSC uh, uh, process is a, is a very well respected one. So we think that the the we should be the first advanced reactor, high temperature reactor out of the blocks. The markets, um, for example, uh, we, we find ourselves working with a company called KBR, which supplies over 50% of the ammonia technology to the world. And ammonia is important both as a, um, in the food system, and it's also because it supplies fertilizer and secondarily it's a very useful hydrogen carrier and those um, folk who are very keen on a hydrogen economy need a way of transporting and storing it effectively for use so we think this is a particularly interesting use case which we're pursuing with um, all due diligence um, uh, so to bring it to a close and to um, really just ram home the message, as, um, uh, 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 as colleagues have said, it's a large market. A large part of that market is going to be heat. And um, we really need to um, uh, get going in terms of addressing relationships with the industrial users who need this to decarbonize their industries. Thank you. Thank you.